All right, welcome back to another episode of the Fearless Future Podcast. I am your host, Glenn. And Amber. My beautiful bride. And so today, we are going to be doing some commentary on Robert Kiyosaki and some of the things that he has said. So I think we should probably uh, jump into that. No, let's go. I'm ready. Bring it. All right, it. let's do it. Buy low, sell high. <laughs> but I never sell. I borrow out. You see, if I, uh, what happens is, let's sell, let me give the same example. I, I buy... Bitcoin or a property at a million dollars, property on the side, it goes up to 10, I'll borrow it at five, those five, that felt $5 million, I still have the property, I haven't sold it, I have no taxable event because I didn't sell it. So that $5 million is tax free because it's debt. You see, debt is the key. And guys, and guys, oh, I live debt free. I mean, you're a stupid monkey, that's what it means. <laughs> you've, just, you've just been a puppet on a string by taught by school teachers and financial planners and all these guys who know nothing about money. All right, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, he's a, got some valid points. He does. There's a lot to unpack there and talk about when it comes to debt, when it comes to net worth and, you know, saying I'm a billionaire, but I'm a billion dollars in debt. There's a lot to unpack there. So I think we should jump in. You want to go? You want me to go? It's interesting that he said, you know, most people don't know how to handle debt, but I think right. there's also different facets to that too. There's people that don't know how to financially handle debt. But then there's also the emotional component to it. You know, they don't Very know true. how to, to handle the stress of that debt and knowing that that's over their head. And they also may not know the difference of good debt versus bad debt. I think that, you know, we should back up and talk about Robert Kiyosaki. If you don't know who he is, you've probably been living in a, under a rock. I don't know. But uh, Robert Kiyosaki, geez, many years ago, probably back in the 80s, he wrote the book called The Cash Flow Quadrant. And the cash flow quadrant was how do you get cash flow in your business? And it was about being an entrepreneur, a business owner, an investor. And everybody wants to, to get to the investor part, the I part of the, the equation. Because so you, first you're an employee, uh, then, you're, then you can be a business owner, then you can be an investor, then you can, or I'm sorry, you want to be an investor at the, at the top of the pyramid. And so- Quadrant. Quadrant, sorry. And the, that, that's the quadrant you want to get to. Yeah. So you want to, you want to get to the part where you're an investor. So you have money and you're investing money to get cash to come back to you. Because then you're not doing the work. Like as a business owner, as we know, you're in the trenches. Yeah. And he's also the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So that if, was if you his, don't know Kiyosaki, that's one of his claims point. to that fame. Was, yeah. That was his first book was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Then Cashflow Quadrant came out next. But you're right. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And Rich Dad, Poor Dad basically was, if you've never read that book, I encourage you to get, you know, they should, people should get their hands in that book because it really talks about how he had two dads. His real, his biological dad was a poor, poor mindset dad. Great guy, but just was a poor mindset. And his rich dad was a, his friend's father and he was a wealthy businessman. So he had very different thoughts about money. And he's, he's ridden that rich dad, poor dad for a long, long way. He's hundreds of millions of dollars he's made off that. So he's done great. So let's go back to the real estate. I think it's important we talk about that. When you mentioned the debt, yeah, it can be stressful. Yeah. There's times- Even if it's good debt, it can be stressful. Yeah, we look at our debt, you know, just from our from what we owe. And if you look at the debt, I think I think it's all about what you focus on, right? Because if you look at the debt, it could freak you out. Mm -hmm. We looked at our debt not too long ago, and it was, you know, in the eight figures. Yep. And I went, huh. Which was really funny to me because what, I was in that same meeting and I saw that. And the thing that's funny to me is you have a much higher threshold for dealing with that than I do. Like your yeah. your risk tolerance level is a lot greater greater than than mine is. But when I saw those numbers, what was also in those was all of our, you know, our rental portfolio. So, so that's all counted against our debt. And that ironically didn't freak me out as much as it did you, because I know we have tenants that are paying for that. It's just, so when you grew up in a household where you're told to live debt free and you they work hard, again, you've got people like, um, he mentioned Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey is a big proponent of live debt free, live debt free, live debt free. Well, that's what he tells everybody else. Yeah, he, he he's he's got a big real estate empire himself. Huge, yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in rental, yeah. and he and he claims that he owes that he doesn't owe anything on him, which is probably true. But when you make when you make a couple hundred million dollars a year or whatever he makes, I think he makes a hundred million dollars a year as a talk show host. Right. It's easier to accumulate. Real estate. Assets. Yeah, yeah. Because you can use the cash from your huge income to do that. But the average person can't do that. Right. That's I think that's what we, we try and preach is that the average person, how do you get your hands on real estate to take advantage of the appreciation of that real estate? Yeah. And the way that everybody does it when you buy a home is with it getting a mortgage. It's the same thing when you buy a rental property. It's what we always talk about. OPM, other people's money. You're right. You've got to figure out the debt threshold. I think most people just don't understand that the more in debt you are, 
typically the more wealthy you are if you're buying the right assets. Now, if you're going to debt and you're buying. If you're just going into credit card debt like crazy, that's, you know, that's yeah. obviously not good debt. If you have good income and you go out and buy a Bugatti or whatever it's called and you buy a, you buy Lamborghinis and you buy a, even a, a plane or. If you're, it, if you're living large yeah. and you can't afford it, you're living beyond your means and. You're going to the bars and buying Cristal and all that stuff and you're really a big show off. I mean, really. You, I'm you, surprised you know all the names of these things, to be honest with you. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very well seasoned. You're very in the world. worldly, yes. I am very worldly when it comes to that. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I have, I have no aspirations to have all that stuff. So it's probably good. I don't yeah, like all we, that stuff. We like experiences. We do. We like experience. But anyways, I think that, you know, people that they get into debt doing that stuff will always lose. Yeah. But if you look at debt, at the end of the day, your net worth is a balance sheet. And your net worth is directly related to, you know, how much is your asset worth minus the debt? Mm -hmm. So if Kiyosaki is a million or a billion, I don't know if he said he's a billionaire in debt. I don't know what that means. I don't know if he means he's a billion dollars in debt. If he is, likely he has, you know, hundreds of millions. I don't know if he's a billionaire, but he has probably has hundreds of millions in, in assets that he owns, but he has, but they're leveraged with the bank. And, and now here's the next thing to unpack. I don't pay any taxes. He said something about being communist, right? For all you communists out there. So he said, I don't pay any taxes. And you know what that is? He takes out more debt on that property. So he has a property, let's just say, let's say his lifestyle requires him to spend, to get, to live $200,000 a year, right? Let's just say that's his lifestyle. And for him, he needs to be able to find $200,000 a year to live his lifestyle and pay his bills. If he were an employee or even a business owner, he would have to earn, let's say, $400,000 because after taxes, good mm -hmm. old Uncle Sam, yep. they're going to nail you for 50% of that and you're left over with $200,000 to live your lifestyle. Right. If you have a cash flowing asset like a multifamily building and he can take a loan out a, and use that building as collateral, take out $200,000, let's say the payment on that is let's say it's a 30 year note and the payment is 2 grand a month for argument's sake. I don't have have it in front of me, but let's say it's 2 grand a month. As long as the rents that come in can pay for that debt, that payment, he keeps that $200,000 and doesn't pay a dime in taxes on it because it's a loan out of the property. Yeah. Right? It's like, it's like if we write a check out of our home equity and put it in our checking account, we don't pay tax on that. It's like one of those things, it's what you, you don't know until you know. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, and there's so many people that think that they know about real estate. How many, how many comments have we gotten on our posts that we do like on Facebook and Instagram and wherever that say, um, oh yeah, you know, you made that much profit on a flip, but what about capital gains? Yeah. Right. You know, like, like you don't know what you don't know. And if you're, if you're not in this world and understand what the tax benefits are and what appreciation and depreciation and right. all those different things are, right. you can't really speak yeah. to it. Yeah. And so it's, it's important to know these things if you're going in this industry. Though. I think people wonder too, like, when can you do that? When can you execute that type of strategy? Like, in other words, when will you have enough, enough equity to be able to pull that money out? And the truth is, it all comes back to when you buy the, the property in the first place. Yeah, buy it right. If you can buy it at a deep enough discount, improve it a little, spend money to improve it, and then you have changed, you've increased the value of the property and you've increased the rent roll. Great. Now, Another argument could be said is, why not just take the money from the rent to do it? Well, you can, but you have to pay tax on that. So now you get to write out, I believe, and I'm not an accountant, so don't hold me to this, but you, have, you get to write off the interest that you pay on the loan, not the principal. Yeah. So if you take a loan out, the rents that come in will pay off that payment, which 90% of that payment is interest. So if the rent that was coming in was 5,000 a month for argument's sake, and your payment was two thousand a month. Well, you're not now. You're only paying taxes on the three thousand a month that you're left over because let's say that you're you know the two thousand or much of the two thousand is interest. Yeah, you're losing me with all these numbers. Well, I'm just showing you. So, so the point is that you you'll you'll pay no taxes or very very yeah. little tax. There, you there's a strategic way to do it, and and the really though you don't really even need to know all that. You just need to have an accountant yeah. that does. But you have got you've got to to be able to take the hits and take the mental hits from the being mental in debt. hits. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, Good. and it was interesting that he brought up, you know, and you said during rich dad, poor dad, like his biological father had the poor mindset right. and mindset is really 
What's the bottom about? line about what this this really comes down to is about- the mindset of can you handle all of these outside pressure? Do you have the internal tools to handle these outside yeah. pressures? All right, let's keep going. All right, so now I think we should uh, pause the podcast for a minute and do our stupid human comment section. Oh, I love this part. Yeah, this one's funny. All right, so this one is, oh, get this, the, we're going to say the name, at Cheeseball6109 is who made this comment. Oh, that's a great, Cheeseball. Uh, that's a great and online And after handle. we hear the comment, I think we're going to understand why their, con- why their handle is Cheeseball. Okay, here's the comment. When Wall Street takes private homes, squatters take back over Wall Street, LOL. So I don't even know like what news program or outlet that you could be watching where you could even get, you know, that, that, that you think that's the context of what they were even saying. Like that makes no sense whatsoever. So they are they are referring to the squatter situation that's going on in the country right now, right? And so we, we've done podcasts on that before. People should go back and listen to it if they want to hear that. But there's this misconception that Wall Street is taking over all homes. And they are. Wall Street's buying a lot of homes as an investment. And I don't think people were prepared for that. So Wall Street is buying those homes up, right? And so this guy is saying when squatters take over, they take back over Wall Street. It's almost it's almost allowing squatters to take houses. It's still, you're still stealing a house. If you, a squatter is someone that goes into a house they don't own. Yeah, they steal it. And essentially, if you live in a blue state, you claim it because if you can stay you there. squatters rights. If you get 30 days, you can stay there and then you become a tenant and then it becomes six months to 12 months to get person out that's not paying a dime in yeah. rent. And, and probably the, ruining your property. And the landlord has to maintain it to keep it safe for the squatter. Okay, welcome to insanity. That's the world we live in up there in, in, uh, in good old New it York and no any, any blue state. But yeah, red states are much better. I like Florida. Yeah. Florida says if you leave, you're if you leave for, yeah, if you come back from your property, if you're a snowbird and you go back to the north, you come back down and somebody's in your property, you call local sheriffs every two hours, bam, they're out of there. Yep. Just chuck them right out. And I've seen some stuff on Facebook, people going, I own this house, I'm supposed to be here. They're like, Wrap your stuff, get out of here, and yep. then put them in handcuffs and take them out. That's the way it should be. Thank you, DeSantis. You're still in the house, but thank you again, uh, Cheeseball, for your stupid human comments. <laughs> so you made the list this week of stupid human comments. So congratulations. And you prove that you really are a Cheeseball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do our next segment with Robert Kiyosaki. We've got a few to go through, so let's, let's wrap through them. And most poor people confuse assets for liabilities. They think their home is an asset. It's actually a liability. Right, so I own 7,000 rental properties. Those are assets. Every month, the cash flows in. Whereas many people have the big house on the hill and the cash is flowing out. Right. And they're going broke. What he's talking about there is the misconception that a house is not an asset. And we've had arguments about this before and we've talked with Grant Cardone about it and it's, or talked about Grant Cardone on the podcast. And so, you know, a lot of people are famous for saying it's not an asset. And while I agree it's not a cash producing asset, Many people, it is the only asset they wind up with at the end of their life. Yeah. My parents were one of them. Yeah. So I know that's how that grows is that some, you're making a monthly payment every month. You have to pay rent someplace. And, and the house is still appreciating. So you get equity in it too. I think though, what, what he is saying in that clip was pretty clear. If you have the big house on the hill. So if you yeah. have a big house, as we know, we have a big house. And so if, it, if you are paying a lot of money every month that goes out the door, you're not really, it's really a liability because it's costing yeah. you money. Because essentially a liability costs money. Right. A car costs money. That's a it liability. It doesn't make you any money. Right. Yeah. An asset is something that appreciates in value, but a cash flowing asset is what you want to do if you're investing right. in real estate. So you always want to be in cash flow. So I don't disagree with them at all um, with that and if you look at it in those terms. But I also want to make sure that we're really clear that most people, like my parents, if they don't have a plan and they get to the end of their retirement, they may have a little 401k, they may have a little, they may live off social security, but their home is their greatest asset at the end of their life. So we can't act like it's not an asset. Now, if you're a business owner and you're saying, where will I put my money? Yeah, don't go, don't go buy your big single family home. Yep. But I I think that that it kind of confuses people too, because they think, oh, well then I should rent. Renting is the better play. And, Uh, and, and I disagree with that in a lot of cases. I mean, there's no like one size fits all approach to, to finances. But, but you're still, you know, do you want to, do you want to pay down on your own mortgage or do you want to pay down on somebody else's mortgage if right. you're renting? Right. 100%. So there's, there's that to be said too. Like, like it just needs to be a, a bigger picture than just, okay, your home's not an asset, so you should rent. You're going to pay for housing one way or the other. Right. You might as well, if you, if you can, you might as well enjoy the four things, right? So you have 
Well, appreciation. There, there's, you don't get cash flow. So there's three things you right. enjoy. There's there's appreciation, depreciation, depreciation. and uh, debt debt, debt reduction. Down. Yes, and you're and you're pay, by you paying rent to yourself, kind of right. When you're paying yeah. your mortgage, you're paying for your housing. You are paying down your debt while right. you're while you're appreciating. So right. it's not the greatest investment, but it's a lot better than having nothing when you get to retirement. Right. All right. Let's play the next one. Don't keep focusing on that paycheck and that income. Focus on acquiring assets. And that was a big shift. Instead of focusing on acquiring income, I shifted it to acquiring assets. And then the assets create the income. Kim Kiyosaki. We met Kim, her. We met her. Yeah, she's delightful. Yeah, she was great. Good to spend time with her and, uh, and get to know her. Uh, Powerful her, woman. Her and Robert have been getting divorced for five years now. Many years, yes. Many years they've been getting divorced <laughs> for her. But it's, when you have that, mu- that many assets and yeah. you built that big of a machine together, it's tough to... It's tough to break apart. Yeah. So it's very difficult. But but be that as it may, I think that what she says is so true. You've got to be able to focus on assets. So when she says focus on income, how many people do we know that are thrilled to get a 10% raise in their job? Right. Or they get a new job and they get a 30% raise in their income. That's so what? Right. If you focus on income, even if you're focused on income in your portfolio, if your stock portfolio, you're focused on getting dividends and income. That's not a horrible thing because you have to buy an asset to get it. But in real estate, you can literally buy an asset. If you keep focusing on that, they will start to produce income. Again, the cool part about this is when you lock into a mortgage, even if a mortgage rate's high right now, right? Right now it's high. It's seven and a half percent or, you know, whatever. They're, they're pretty high rates. Eventually that'll come down. You can refinance that and lock into a lower rate. Right. And once you're locked into a good rate, even the rate you're at now, if you lock into that, the, that rate, that payment will stay the same, but your rents increase. increase. And so that's a game changer in five years and 10 years and 15 years because the payment is the same, but your income starts to become greater. Now you could argue that taxes, taxes in, and insurance could go yeah, up. Yeah, but it all depends on the area because some taxes don't typically increase as fast as rents have been increasing. Yeah. And so right now you could argue that rents are increasing faster than anything else in the market right now. They're just, they're increasing at a, at a almost exponential rate, which is, I'm not sure when that's going to stop, but it's, it's increased a lot. And I, I think to being, there's a, a lot of people that don't want to go into the rental game for a couple of reasons. One is they don't want to be a typical landlord. They don't want to have to screen people and evict yeah. people and, you know, fix the toilet when Who it does? overflows and all, all that stuff. To. And that was definitely one of the reasons I didn't want to be as well. But when you, you know, the way we teach it is, is not to do that. You know, you hire yeah. a property management company. But the other thing I think that really intimidates people when it comes to this, and again, it's one of those things that you don't know what you don't know, is, is the responsibility of having another mortgage. And then the thought that goes through their mind or that went through my mind was, yeah, but if there's not a tenant in it, or if I can't get it rented for one reason or another, then I'm on the hook for making that payment. And I can't afford to make that payment. Yeah. But the reality is that, and, and this is one thing I love about real estate is it's a lot of math. You know, I, I commented about not wanting to do math today, but, Here but, you it, go. but, but it, it, you know, you get to make very statistical decisions and calculated decisions based on information and, and real estate, there's a ton of data yeah. to base your decisions off of. So, you know, you look at the cap rate and how often, you know, you, you put some money aside to make sure that when it's vacant that you have an, it's so, important. It's important to have a little bit of money set aside to start a real estate portfolio. I mean, you can start is. with nothing, you know, but it's 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 important to have some cash flow coming in so you can deal with but, a situation. But my point is the issue that I had created and the story that I had told myself isn't really true. That, you know, if you're buying houses in, in a good area where, you know, the rents are stable and, you know, there's not like a ton of vacant homes or anything, you know, you, you can make smart decisions when it comes to real estate. So my caution is to have the right mon- mindset when you're going into this. And I mean, I totally agree with Kim. You know, you want to have those assets. I, I didn't want to be a, a, I had no interest in having a rental portfolio in the beginning when we started. I just wanted to flip the houses. And I have done a total 180 with that. Yeah. Like I want more rentals. Right. Whether it's, you know. Whatever it might be, we want cash flowing right. assets. We want cash flowing assets. Yeah, that's and what we're so, focused on now. So I, I think that's important for people to think about, you know, and, and really make, um, rational decisions and not just base it on a story that you think you know what you know. All right. It's time for our Gen X lost memory segment. So looking These forward, I'm looking forward to giving you a little test here and see if you recognize this. This might be a, this might be one you have to think about a little bit. 
We'll see. It was a fantastic movie. And anybody who's a Gen Xer will remember this movie. I do believe. So let me play the clip. And I'll tell you this. It's the last line in a fantastic movie. The very last line. So it should stand out, but let's, uh, let's go ahead and play it now. All right, let's go. Dad? Dad, are you all right? One thing about living in Santa Carla, I never could stomach. All the damn vampires. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? We were flicking through TV the other day, and this was on. This is Lost Boys. Yes. That was such a great movie. The main guy in it, oh, he was so hot. I had such a crush on him. He, which main guy? Keeper? The, no, the the one that they turned into a vampire. Oh. Um, Michael. Yeah, Michael. I forgot, what, I forgot what his actual name is, but yeah. Oh, yeah. He was yeah, so hot. Oh, my God. And then Corey. Uh, Corey ha- Haim. Yeah, he passed away. He was, uh, yeah, he was he was the character in there, too. Yeah. So And Nanook, the husky. Yeah. Remember oh, Nanook? yeah. We have oh, a yeah. husky now, right? Yep. So Nanook was the dog. So, yeah. Corey Haim and Corey Feldman were in that, weren't yes, they? Yes, they both, both were. Of, yeah. yeah, both Corys were in that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, what a great movie that was. But I just want to make sure we threw in the Gen X Lost Memories. We call oh, it the Lost Memories because. As a Gen Xer, I walk in the other room and I forget why I walked in there. So we call it <laughs> lost memories, but we like to bring that those, up. Those long-term memories aren't so lost, though. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I forget why I walked in a room, but I hear that and go, hey, Lost Boys is on. <laughs> so, or it's over, I should say. So yes. that line is on. So cool. All right. Hey, we got one more Robert Kiyosaki moment to listen to and respond to. So let's do that now. If you understand history, the reason I pay no taxes is because I borrow money. I'm a debtor. And check this out. I mean, all you communists out there, check this stuff out. I am a billionaire in debt. You know why? Because I get tax breaks for borrowing money. And the reason I am so rich is because I'm in debt. And my friend Dave Ramsey says, live debt free. Well, you're an idiot. I mean, he's my friend, but I say, Dave, I like debt. He says, I know, but most people can't handle debt. I said, I agree. But that's why there's no financial education in schools, because if you knew how to handle debt, you wouldn't save that crappy dollar you have in your hand. I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather borrow the money tax free. Yeah, I don't know about being a stupid monkey. I think it depends on. I think it depends. He's, he's not shy about throwing out the. He's the not shy. Communist and stupid monkey. Oh and yeah, yeah, idiot. yeah. No, I uh, yeah, no, he has no problem with that. I, I think that, you know, we've already covered a lot of this earlier in the podcast, but he is right. But you have to have a certain stomach to deal with that. Yeah. Because I, I am like him. I, I don't want to get rid of any assets. We just recently have sold our home in upstate New York. Beautiful home, right? We decided that it wasn't cash flowing yep. like we thought it would as a, short, as a short-term rental. So we made a, a decision. We wanted to finish our home down here. Yep. So we pulled the equity out and now we're going to finish our home down here in Florida. And so- we we did that. Now that's not going to be a taxable event because we we lived there the past two of the, uh, the past five years, right? We talked to our yep. tax strategist, so there won't be a taxable event. But I think it's important to remember that if you have assets you can borrow against to get the money out, that's the best way to take your money out. We covered that before. I think it's again, it's a different mindset, but you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with looking at a balance sheet and saying, I owe five million, I owe ten million, I owe a hundred million, I owe five hundred million dollars. Whatever that number is, the the wealthier you are, probably the more debt you have on certain assets. Now, everybody's different. Mark Cuban, I have no idea what his debt might be. He may have very little or none, but he made a ton of money when he sold his company. I think it was sold to Google or to, I forget, I don't think it was Google, whoever, whoever he sold it to back yeah. in the day. He made, and then he, had, then he did a very strategic trade on Wall Street, as they called it one of the top 10 trades of all time. He, I won't go into the details because I don't really know. I don't live that world, but he, he, uh, he made a strategic move so that when the, the market tanked, he was able to cash out and be a multi-billionaire. So he may not have to worry about the debt like other people that are building assets from the ground up. Again, if you don't have a solid income, how do you do it? If you don't have debt, how do you build a, a massive portfolio from nothing. Yeah, you, you if, have to start from where you're at. And if you make 100 grand a year, two, if you make 200 grand a year, honestly, 200 grand a year in today's world, I don't know how most households survive. Yeah. 200 grand a year, by the time you do that, you're going to take home 100 grand a year. How do you survive on that? I, with, with inflation where it's at, I don't even know how you, I know. How it's you crazy. have a decent life for your family. And, you know, I mean, you could certainly, you're not a pauper, but you're not as wealthy as you think you are. Right. 200 grand used to be a huge number to earn. Now, I think you have to have that just for basic standard of living, right. put your kids in school, 
you know, put your kids to college, you know, have a, have a couple cars, have a nice home yeah. and, and be able to save a little for retirement. How do you make 200 grand a year and then become a multimillionaire or a decamillionaire or a centimillionaire or a billionaire? Yeah. Of, How of, do you do it? Of any generations that have happened, I, I think now is like the, you, you have to have a plan B, like yeah. you have to have a side hustle, not even yeah. just a plan B, but a side hustle because of inflation. Cause it, you know, most people aren't going to be able to make it with the way inflation's going you, with housing and groceries and gas. Everything. And, everything's crazy. I mean, we, we're having estimates on our house right now and it's, it's yeah, insane. It's insane. The, yeah. The, the pool's quarter million dollars to starting price. Well, like, well the guy, the guy said a few years ago, it was like, what did he say? Concrete was 20 bucks for a yard or whatever. Now yeah. it's like 300. Yeah. I, I might have my yardage yeah. off there, but, but, everything, but everything, it, was, yeah. it was just how like crazy expensive yep. things got. Yeah, don't get me going on politics because they they stopped all the supply and delivery during COVID yeah. and it got crazy expensive. And then people realized, hey, shipping got crazy. People will pay this, so they right. keep it high. Right. That's 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 basically what happened. Right. Some stuff came down, but a lot of stuff didn't come down. So been the same. But I think Kiyosaki's whole whole mentality is this, and you've got to be able to be okay with debt. Yeah. And if you're not okay with debt, then you can save and try your best to to build wealth. But remember, the cool part about debt. This might be the best thing to remember out of this podcast. The debt can always be removed by selling the asset. So, and you're never going to fully take debt on a property. If a property's worth, you know, a million dollars and your debt, the most the bank will let you take is usually 775 to 80, 70 to 80%. Right. Let's say your debt is 700,000 on that property and times get tough. Something happens. You can sell the property and you still have the equity you can take out and pay off the debt. So right. if you said, Hey, listen, I'm in my life. I'm a, I'm a billion dollars in debt. You can have your team sell all those assets off. Now you have to pay tax mm -hmm. on the on the on the equity and whatever. There's some other tax uh, things there, but that's how you can get rid of the debt if you just decide one day you don't want it. You're done. But you gotta you gotta be like Rocky says. You gotta be able to take the hits, and the hits are I'm in debt. Yeah, I owe a lot of people a lot of money. Right. But I have assets that pay that for me. If you can change your mindset to that, you can be a real estate investor and do great great things. No, mostly, I shouldn't say all, a lot of businesses take on debt or they sell a piece of their business. If you watch Shark Tank, yeah, they do two things. Most of the time they buy a piece of that business. So you, you either sell a piece of your asset to get cash, to keep your business going. For a percentage. Yeah. Or you take a, a loan. For a sizable percentage. Yep. 10%, 20%, 10 percent, 20 percent, 30, usually, 40 yeah. percent. They take a big chunk of it's your business. And then that's what you sell to get cash for your business. So you sold off an asset or you take out a loan. And many times in Shark Tank, they'll give you a loan. Yep. They'll say, I'm going to give you a loan on the debt. You pay me back at 9%. And, I, and they still get a piece of your company for that. So they still take 5% of your company or 10% or 3%, whatever the negotiating rate is. So you're still giving up an asset because they're a shark. Right. Because they're going to help you do that. So I think it's just important to remember that one way or the other, when you're building a business, you probably got to give up something somewhere along the way, either debt to help you grow and get cash flow. Because if you have no cash flow, even a flipping business, if we don't have cash flow, we're dead in the water. Yep. We've got to pay payroll. We've got to pay expenses. We've got to pay before a house flips. We have to do that. Before we wrap up, I think that was all really good information. Um, before we wrap up, though, I want to address one more thing that he said in that last clip. And it was, you know, we're, uh, society is going off of what they've been taught in school or by financial advisors. And they are not the end all answer. You know, we're, we're not taught good finance in school. Our we're, children are we're not. We're taught by teachers and professors that live, that live paycheck to paycheck. Right. Many times. Right. And, and school creates a worker society. It doesn't create entrepreneurs by and large. Not, not so, by a long, and not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur. Let's be no, honest. Not of course everybody. not. But I, you know, I think if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably somebody that is looking for that side hustle. You are looking for a different way to retire. You're looking for in real estate, whatever. So it's really good to get um, information from people that have been there, done that, yeah. and that are successful. I think it's important too to remember that your job title does not mean that you're smart with money. No. Do you remember? Oh my many gosh, years I know what ago, you're going to say. We did a we did a, a home, a home workshop. workshop, and I and a guy was there who was a surgeon. He was a surgeon. He's not the one I was thinking of. It was so. Go ahead and tell them one, and then I'll tell them. Well, mine. that guy made seven hundred thousand yeah. dollars a year in income. Yeah, seven hundred thousand dollars a year. I met with him personally. He was broke. Yeah, and he had a horrible credit score, yep. and he had nothing. He could not rub two nickels together. Couldn't do it, and he made seven hundred grand as a yeah thoracic surgeon, whatever he was. Yeah, and I, just so I guess my point is, you know, 
it'd be better if everybody just wore their balance sheet and their right around their chest so you know who you're talking to, right? The, get get uh, the other one I was thinking of was people. the very first home flipping workshop we ever did. Maybe it's the second one. Um, I met with a guy who really wanted to get into real estate. He was a financial advisor, oh, I and he that. was in the same position. He didn't have two nickels to rub together. Yeah, and I was like, that really upset me because here he is giving other people financial advice yep, and he broke. can't even yep. right that that's your job title you're a financial advisor you're giving other people financial advice and you're broke be careful who you take advice from because you, you might, might end up just like them. that's right that concludes this episode of the fearless future podcast if you like it make sure that you click that like button and then make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a beat